we're going to be looking in just a moment at page 13. But before you go to page 13, I have something that's not in the book that we want you to be a part of. And so find you a blank page, maybe on the back page of number 12 or whatever, but find you a blank, blank page and put it the top of that page. This is still on if I walk around, right, sir? Okay. Put at the top of that page three words, if you choose to do this. My, M-Y, grief, room. My, grief, room. Now you say, what are you talking about? Tonight, you have a grief room, whether you know it or not. A grief room is not a 60 by 120 or whatever this is. A grief room is not a 10 by 12. A grief room is where and how you grieve. It may not be a literal room. For some, it may be. It may be that you have a back porch and that's where you go when you think about your memories of your loved one. And it may be that you talk to them there. And it may be that around you are articles that they have made or things that are meaningful to you. But everybody has a grief room. Everybody has a way in which they deal with their grief. Now, here's the most important thing that I'm about to say. There is no right way. There is no wrong way. There's your way. As long as you're not hurting yourself or hurting others, your grief room is your grief room. But we need to think about it in terms of how do I grieve? And so one of the questions that you might ask yourself is, where do I grieve? Here behind me are examples of people in my grief classes from years gone by that drew their grief rooms. With permission, I asked for them to give me a copy, and many of them did. And so these are examples, and I'd be more than glad after the fact, after we're finished, for you to come up and take a look at these. Or if you want to take a picture of them, please don't take them because these are the originals. And I show them to others. Some of these come from aged people. Some of them come from professional workers. Some of them come from children who drew their grief room. There's one over here from Katie, an eight or nine year old. She's going down the highway with her granddaddy when her granddaddy driving the car has a massive heart attack. She has to grab the wheel so it doesn't wreck. Her granddaddy died. Katie wanted to share in the class that we had about how she grieved. And so you might want to take a look at that one over on this side. But everybody has a grief room. And the question is, how big is your grief room? I don't mean 10 by 12 or 20 by 40, but I'm saying, do you desire for others to be a part of your grief experience? Do you allow and want others to come into your grief and sit a while? Or would you rather try to handle it alone or in piecemeal circumstances? Again, not a right way, not a wrong way, as long as you're not hurting yourself. It's the way you're dealing with grief. So here are some questions for you to think about. You don't have to answer them to me. You just need to think about this in regards to your own particular grief room. 
What kind of chairs do you have in your grief room? Are they strata loungers where people can come and sit a long, long time and talk to you about your loss and you listen to them about their losses and you invite them into your life? Or do you have some straight chairs? Or do you just have one chair for you? Because, you know, right now I'm really not comfortable in you coming and spending a long time talking to me about my grief. I'm not at that point. Again, not a right, not a wrong, just your way. So how many chairs do you have in your grief room? Secondly, what kind of door do you have to your grief room? Is it one of those old kind country store kind of doors, you know, that's got the screen on them, doesn't even have a lock on it, it just easily opens and closes and people can come and go, you know, as they please? Or is it a door that's solid with the exception of one little peephole and the peephole's on your side, not on theirs? Because when somebody knocks, you're looking to say, I don't know if I want them to come into my grief room or not. Now again, we're not talking about a little room, we're talking about your grief, your journey, how you're dealing with your loss. So what kind of door do you have? Does your grief room have windows? Do you want to be reminded that there is an outside, that there is the sun that's going to shine again, that you can see the moonlight in the light above and God as well? Or is it completely shut off? Again, not right or wrong, just the way you're dealing with your grief. So far, does this make sense? Do like this, if you, if you will, or that way, and we can go back. Okay, so far, so good? All right. So, we talked about the grief room, not talking about the size. We're talking about the door, how open you are to allow people into your grief, your journey. It is a journey. What kind of doorknob is on your door? Is there one on their side, but not on yours? How many locks are there on that door? How many keys are available for people to come in to your grief room? Where is it? Here you go, right here. My grief room is filled with windows and an open door. It welcomes anyone who would like to talk about my brother. He was a song leader in the church. Lights are not needed. Memories completely like the room. Music is abundant in the room. Favorite hymns can be heard at any time. He was a song leader in the Lord's church. Died very suddenly. And this is what his sister said about the grief room. So, we've talked about the door. We've talked about the locks, the peephole, what kind of chairs, the door. Does it have those side lights on the side so that people can look in? Or is it completely closed off so that again, you look out, but they can't see you in regards to what's going on. What's in your room beside the chair? Is the Bible there? Is there a phone there? Are there things around you that cause you to remember them? All you got to do is look up. Here's a lady who went scaled a model. I mean, literally. And some of you know more about it than I do. But she's got 
his tie still hanging over there on the on one of the hooks. She's got his pitch pipe because he too was a song leader. She's got some of the other things. And and she'll she goes into she says, My grief room the first month. You might want to take a look at that one. Wonderful, wonderful lady. Here's somebody who had one with telephone. And she said, I have chairs for all my friends and family. One of these actually has a church pew. I like that one. Because they said, my church are welcome. And I've got a pew right there for them to come and, and sit in. So, what kind of chairs? What kind of door? What kind of items? Or around me, what kind of doorknob? And how accessible are people into my grief? That's really what a grief room is about. I would be honored if tonight, when you go back home and you decide. Only if you decide to draw your grief room, I would love to see it tomorrow if you chose to do that. You don't have to at all. This isn't homework where you, I want to check you at the door. Not at all. But sometimes grief is therapeutic to help us think about how do I manage my grief. And please, I'll say it again, not a wrong way, not a right way, it's your way provided you're not harming yourself or you're not harming others. Any thoughts about the grief room before we move on to in common? Any questions or any comments about that? Last year during COVID, we had to have a class at our congregation only. I'm starting another one this coming Wednesday. And this dear lady, had lost her husband. Brother Duell was a man from the war. And you can look at this. But she said, "My grief room is in the corner of my house. It's literally a place. And I have the flag that was given in his memory at his death, and I have the artifacts of things that he made in his pictures. And over here to the side, you see five people, and that's the family. Every year they went to the Smokies. And so she included that picture that every year, because the memories, the good memories they had. I remember one year I was up there, and there they were. And uh, then they told me the story that they always ate at that place. And so this was her grief room. And she wrote on the back, My mind still talks to you, and my heart still looks for you, but my soul's, soul knows that you are at peace. This couple sits right behind me in church. We, we miss Brother Duel, but we know where he is. And so... That's her grief room. You might want to take a look at it. Some of these are, in children, are, are, are written by children. And so, but I wanted you to think about that concept. Bill McDonald came up with this idea. And I think that's really, really important. 13. A survey of some 600 families were asked the question, how did you make it through your grief journey? And these are the things that they came up with. And I think it's important for us to keep that in mind. Also, I want you to write some two other words down somewhere. Maybe on that page that you were on when you did your grief room. Write down these two words, if you will. Grief is what is grief to you 
personalize this class to make it come home to you, you need to be able to put into your own words or drawing. I've had somebody draw artwork about grief. You can see it up here. She was a great artist. But what is grief to you? That's one of the things that, that, that I do in the 10-week class. And I ask them, in your own words, what grief is to you? Again, not right or wrong. There's just your way of looking at grief. And I hope that you'll keep that in mind. And I hope that you will uh, think about doing that. I want you to listen to this lady. Actually, I want you to listen to both of these first and then tell me what you hear. Here's the first one. To me, grief is like falling into a bottomless pit, continuously hitting the sides and being cut by the sharp rocks. There's no end to the fall and the pain never ceases. There's no light at the end of the tunnel, no way out. It is probably like living for an eternity in hell would be like. Nothing will ever be the same, and so you wonder why go on. What did you hear out of this statement? Depression? Desperation. I'm sorry. What else? Despair. Pain. Hopelessness. What? Hopelessness. This particular lady had lost a son-in-law due to suicide. And those were her feelings. Why go on? Now I want you to listen to this one. In the Webster's Dictionary, grief means a cause of such suffering, a mishap or disaster, to grieve means sorrow. Since May 22, 1999, at 7.55 p.m., not only has suffering been a part of my daily life, but that day was the worst mishap and the greatest disaster of my entire life. Sorrow is something that awakens me in the morning. It follows me everywhere all day, and it goes to bed with me at night. People say, stay busy. How much busier can one be than to take a college computer class, go to a grief support class, stay active in church, and help people less fortunate than I? I feel sad for what I have lost. I feel poor for the empty space. I cry for what I cannot have. I am restless for my life is not whole. However... You cannot abandon the ship simply because you cannot control the winds. I am not going to give up on God. I am going to thank Him for what I have left. What did you hear from this lady? A survivor. Hope. Faith. Anything else? Yes. I'm sorry. Resilience. Okay, in the face of desperation. You know, when we're younger, we jump up pretty quick. With these, uh, these new knees that I have, I don't get up quite as quick as I used to. You know, they've got, they got about 64 and a half years on them in terms of the body. But I can still get up. It just takes a while, you know. But yeah, you're right. You're exactly right. That's right. It's very important. This lady lost not one husband, but two. First one to a drowning boating accident, and the second one to um, cancer after some 15 years. And I love the statement that she said at the very end of this. 
which I did not read. God will steal the storm or else he will calm his child. That just reaffirms what you said. God will steal the storm or else he will calm his child. It was a blessing to have her in, the, in, in our class. Her husband had nine years of cancer. And she tells the story, and some of you can relate to this, that after his death, she just had to close up that room. It was just too much for her. They came and got the bed, and she closed it up. And she said one day, her four-year-old grandson came to visit. This was several months later. And he came bounding into the room, and he said, Why is Poppy's door closed? And before she could answer it, he burst open the door and opened it and began to say, I remember sitting in his lap as he would tell me those stories. And she said what she had trouble doing, a four-year-old did automatically. And the door stayed open. Many of you can relate to that. In common, 600 bereaved families, how do you make it through the grief journey? Number one, they find someone to share their grief with. That may mean new friends. I knew of a lady who said, my church doesn't grieve for me. She ended up going somewhere else. It may be, you know, a new mate in time. Sometimes people have told me that as widows or widowers, they feel like a fifth wheel. They feel out of place in the midst of others that are couples. It's important that we make sure that our widows and widowers are cared for and loved and treated with dignity and with respect regardless of whether they are married or not. They find someone to share their grief with. A lady was at a nursing home. She walked up to the new male resident and said, you look like my third husband. <laughs> and he said, well, how many have you had? Two. Got to, got, got to give her A for trying, right? I knew of a lady, dear friend of ours, she's in her 80s. Her mother had four, count them, four Christian husbands. Two of them were brothers in the flesh as well as brothers in the Lord. And she outlived all of them. And about a year after the fourth one had died, she said, Brother Don, can you find me another husband? <laughs> Somebody heard this story. They said, who wants to be married to her? You're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> they find someone to share their grief with. Secondly, they make a decision to move on. Please understand, moving on does not mean forgetting. You're not going to forget your loved one. Your hope is that no one else does. When I was a full-time minister, I would try to remember the date of the death of the loved ones in our congregation. And a year later, and two years later, and hopefully even three years later, I'd send them a note saying, as I recall, this week is the anniversary, the second anniversary of the death of your and name them. I want you to know I'm praying for them and praying for you and praying for your family. So many people, they're not going to forget. They're afraid we're going to forget. And yet those people that died, in some cases, were the ones that taught you the gospel or the ones that sit near you 
or the ones that brought you those wonderful meals in times past. And so it's really, really important that we don't forget and that we be there for them. Making, making a decision to move on is not forgetting. Thirdly, they clean up relationships. Some people, I understand, have gone after 9-11 from years ago to weekly reunions. Don't wait, you know, if they're every year or every two or three years, but weekly reunions because it's so, so very important. Number four, they become forgivers. We all need forgiveness. Ephesians 4.32 talks about the need for forgiveness. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Why? Even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. If God, as bad as I am sometimes, is willing to forgive me, I've got to extend the same grace and mercy to others. Even to the folks sometimes I hurt. Sometimes we may need, may need to forgive them for our sake. Whether they've changed or not, we just need to forgive them for our sake so that we can help move on. Number five, they become amends makers. Brother Dow Flatt was a professor of Bible at Freed Hardeman. Wonderful, wonderful man of God. Came from a country town in Tennessee. Had a gold tooth sticking out right here. A doctorate from a New Orleans Theological Seminary. Very smart man. He tells the story that the New Orleans Jazz aren't the Jazz anymore in basketball, right? Aren't, there another, isn't there, aren't they another name? I'm not sure. I think they are. But when they were the New Orleans Jazz and he was going to school there, he said that just to get away, just to do something simple, fun, he would go to the ball games. And he said, sometimes I get fired up, you know, basketball and whatever. And he said, I started going, uh, I started using some of the old calls that we had from way back, back there in the country town that I grew up in. And so he'd, and this was a short fella, he wasn't really tall, but He'd, he'd get up and say, chew tobacco, chew tobacco, spit on the wall. Come on, Jazz, get that ball. <laughs> and they loved it. In fact, they, I understand they gave him free tickets because he was firing up the crowd. That was the human side of him. You, you had him, didn't you? I remember him in Philippians chapter 4, verse 5, where it talks about that your Kindness needs to be known to all men. And he made the statement, be willing to meet people halfway. And I've never forgotten that point. Be willing to, forget, to meet people halfway. Amends. Try to make an amends. You see, grief is a mirror. We can look at ourselves in the mirror and we can see some things that perhaps we need to change. You know, you know, do your hair here or you've got something on your face or whatever. Grief is a mirror and we see it for what it does to us. And it needs to be a mirror as long as we need for it to be a mirror. What it's caused me. What we want ultimately is for the glass to turn outward and become a window where I can see not only my reflection in the glass, but I can see the hurts of others. And in the grief journey, when we get to the point where we don't have to have grief like a mirror, always looking at what it's causing me, but I can turn it outward 
and begin to see the hurts of others. First of all, we're beginning to heal. And secondly, we're doing the work of Jesus. Because that's what he did. Think about the word compassion, how it's used about our Lord. He saw the multitudes. He saw the pitiful situations they were in, and he did something about it. And so when grief is first a mirror, and nobody needs to tell you when to turn it outward. You keep it that way as long as you need to. You know, I can't take care of your pain physically. Only you can. You know, the doctors can tell you. It's time, you know, you, you, can, you can take that out of the sling or you, you can put the crutch away. Let somebody else who knows tell you those things. Don't let somebody say, well, it's been six months. You should be over that by now. Just forgive them. They haven't been where you are or they wouldn't say that for some period of time. But when the glass turns outward and you still see yourself in the reflection, but you also see the hurts of others, then you're beginning to heal. Notice what it says in number six. They learn that in giving... They receive, they, they receive. Helen Keller in our neck of the woods, Tuscumbia, Alabama, is where uh, she spelled out water. There's an outdoor play there. I'm inviting you right now. Next year, June to the middle of July, need a place to stay? Call me. Outdoor play. Wonderful play. Anybody seen the Helen Keller play? Okay, yeah. Yeah, he came over <laughs> a couple of times. Great play. Helen Keller knew something about pain. As long as you sweeten someone else's pain, life is not in vain, is what she said. Bill McDonald, who helped start us in this work, told of a woman who'd lost her husband but couldn't move on. For months she was in the same place. I don't mean literally, but just grief. Always talking about the issues, always. He finally did something that not too many counselors would have done, but he said, ma'am, I don't want you to come back until you are ready to talk, not about the past, but about what you're going to do about it. Well, he didn't see her for several weeks. Finally, he heard her in the outdoor office of their funeral home. And he heard her laughing with the, the ladies out front. And then she came in and she had this big smile on her face. And he said, what have you done? Have you done something to your hair? No, no, no. You got a new dress? Oh, no, no, no. Last night, Bill, I made 12 dozen cookies. Oh, you're on a sugar high. No, no, no. Just listen. I made 12 dozen cookies. I took those 10 pans out I put one, one here, one here, all the way down, and then I put 12 cookies in each one of them, and then I wrapped them up and took them to someone else. Now, what was she saying? The glasses turn outward. Has she forgotten her husband's death? Not at all. But she was beginning to see that in giving, she received. A farmer had a dog named Dolly out in the country, a big sign, puppies for sale. A little boy came by and saw the sign. He said, sir, I see you have some puppies. He said, yes. He said, can I see them? He said, sure. He said, they're for sale. He said, well, I have 39 cents. Can I see? Oh, sure, you can see them. Come on, Dolly. Here came Dolly, the big mother, with all these puppies bouncing, just furry, running behind her to where the little boy and the farmer was. Then he looked back and he saw another dog, but it was moving slowly. It had a drag on its leg, and it was moving real, real slow. Are all these for sale? He said, yes, they're all for sale, son. 
He said, I want that one, talking about that last one. Son, you don't want that one. He was born with a bad leg. He's not going to be able to run and play like all the other dogs. You don't want that one. The little boy reached down on his pants leg and pulled it up. And you could see a steel bar that was attached to the bottom of his foot all the way up his leg. And he said, I know how it feels not to be able to run and play. I want that one. How much does that one cost? And the farmer said, there's no cost for love. Sometimes, in the midst of your tragedies, in the midst of your sorrows, you're going to be able to help people that Ron and I never will be able to because you live where they are. And someday, you take care of yourself first. Let it be a mirror as long as it needs to be. But then slowly begin to turn it outward and see the hurts of others. In giving, they receive. People who make it through the grief journey learn to live in the present moment. Paul put it this way in Philippians 3. Forgetting those things which are behind. This one thing I do. Reaching forth over those things which are before, I press on toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Think about all he had to forget. He had had families put to death thinking that he was doing the right thing. He had separated children from their parents. He had held the clothes of those that stoned Stephen, right? Forgetting those things which are behind and then number eight, they share their new feeling of life. There is light at the end of the tunnel. William Faulkner in his book Wild Palms said, Between grief and nothing, I will take grief. That's a statement that you're going to have to answer for yourself. Between grief and nothing, I will take grief. One of the writers from way back made the statement, is it better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all? Again, you've got to answer that. Oh, Don, the, the pain is, yeah, I can only imagine because I don't know that pain. But is it better to have loved and lost them, still have the memories, than never to have loved before you go to a cemetery and you see the tombstone and on there you see two dates what do those dates represent birth and death and what is often between those two dates a dash guess what we're living our dash we know when we were born, 1957. We don't know the other yet, but we're living our dash. It's up to us to use our lives to live that dash, first of all, in honor to God, who has blessed us with so, so very much. Secondly, to honor the deceased. Earl Groman, a Jewish rabbi, said it's the greatest monument you can ever erect is to l live a life of meaning and purpose in their honor. And it's so, so very important. Tonight we have talked about some very serious subjects and my hope is that you go with hope and with some more information that can help you. We'd be more than glad to to talk with you after the fact in regards to anything that we've said. But at the same time, we want to honor the time that we had, the limitations that we had, had given. And so uh, we want to honor that. But we cannot thank you enough. David, do you want to say anything on the...